welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. We're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. The B-2 has rightly been identified as the culmination of Jack Northrup's lifetime dream and mission to prove the worthiness of the flying wing concept. Today, we are privileged to have two of the key players whose job it was to actually demonstrate the functional reality of Jack Northrop's dream. Troy Johnson, Northrop Grumman Aerospace Systems Sector Chief Test Pilot, and Don Weiss, B2 Program Chief Test Pilot. Gentlemen, the podium is yours. Thank you, Cindy, for that introduction. So I am curious to know before we get started, who amongst you is not from Northrop Grumman? Oh, holy cow. Well, we're safer than I thought. <laughs> Any of you that is not from Northrop Grumman and someone next, sitting next to you who didn't raise their hand has a roll or a tomato, then please take it from them. <laughs> so, uh, uh, as Cindy said, I'm Don Weiss. I joined Northrop Grumman, then Northrop, and the B-2 Test Force as a test pilot in 1987. I started flying the airplane in 1991, been flying her since. That includes all aspects of engineering, manufacturing, development, as well as production acceptance, up until the delivery of the last new airplane and the end of EMD in 1997. And since then, program depot maintenance, as well as follow-on flight test. I joined the B-2 uh, Combined Test Force at Edwards Air Force back in uh, 1994 as an Air Force developmental test pilot and uh, did three years of flight testing at Edwards. And then after that, I went to the B-2 program office, did a tour there. And then uh, my last tour in the Air Force, I went to Whiteman Air Force Base and did operational testing there. I retired from the Air Force and uh, joined uh, Northrop now. When I was at Edwards, I had a really good time there with the flight testing, particularly with the B-2. And, uh, but I never thought we'd end up back there, but I uh, got a phone call out of the blue from one of the managers at Northrop Grumman and, and, uh, and took a job. So the, uh, if some of y'all have been from the Antelope Valley, you've probably heard about the curse of the Antelope Valley. If you've been there once, you're destined to come back again. So that's my story. We first gave this briefing in 2014, 25 years of the B-2. So obviously it's a little dated, but the history is certainly still accurate. And uh, many of the projects to which we'll speak that were then future projects are now underway. We'll be giving you a little bit of background on the airplane, talk some about flight test, employment of the airplane, some fun recollections, and wrap it up with a brief summary and then a, uh, uh, some time for a Q&A. The B-2 is the second operational airplane to employ stealth technology. She's the first operational airplane to employ a curved surface approach. The design requirements that you see up there on the left and the technologies from the tacit blue demonstrator pictured on the right were incorporated into the then advanced technology bomber which we know today as the B-2 Spirit. The changes that you see pictured below in plan form in a sawtooth versus the original single dog tooth trailing edge and terrain following were well incorporated by 1987. When I joined, we were deep in simulation, human factors evaluation of workload, avionics, and flying qualities. Talk some specifics regarding numbers in uh, flight test, the airplane's systems, and her weaponry. There were six airplanes in the test program. They had focused missions, as you see listed on the slide. That continued up until the end of EMD 1997 and we continued on with a single dedicated airplane for flight test. That was ship number three up until 2009. 2009, it became ship 18. She's the airplane we still have today. Software is uh, certainly a large and important part of any test program and especially modern day airplanes. You notice the 58 software drops that we had in this airplane for the eight years of EMD, and we've had some 40 drops since then in the 20 years since. 
The B2 is responsible for a number of firsts and contributions to aerospace and combat aviation. I'll just touch on a couple of these. We were the first airplane to incorporate GPS-guided munitions in the form of the 2,000-pound joint direct attack munition. Additionally, in that time period, we developed on our own a 5,000-pound GPS-aided munition, predecessor to the GBU-28, the now operational bomb. Our wing contains the, what was then the single largest piece of composite structure that existed in the world. And our airplane incorporates an integrated federated architecture in the avionics that allows a significant amount of automation. So to illustrate, an air crew, set of air crew approaching an airplane prepared for alert would hit a slap switch on the nose gear. The crew entry door would open and both aux power units start up. As the crew climbs in and straps in, they hit a single switch auto start, all four engines start, the avionics start ready for taxi, the APUs shut down, the crew only need shut the crew entry door and they're ready to go. Since EMD, our plane has kept pace with the times. She's had updates in communications, sensors, avionics and weaponry. The addition of Link 16 allows the airplane today to participate in the modern, the modern data link battlefield. The addition of an AESA radar antenna gives our airplane and their, her sensors the ability to grow significantly into the future. The update of our processors to advanced processors and a fiber optic backbone allowed our airplane to go from those Intel 8086 512K 5 megahertz systems to a now 100 gigabyte, 100 megahertz system, again, opening the airplane to tremendous uh, software advancements in the future. So I'm gonna talk about the uh, weapons uh, delivery system on the uh, B-2. Of course, that's at the heart of the, uh, the B-2 uh, aircraft. And uh, we're gonna talk about some of the uh, enhancements since EMD, but before I get into that, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on the, uh, the weapons uh, bay and the configurations of uh, delivery uh, systems that we could carry. So if, in the slide, on the, on the right-hand side of the slide, you see uh, an illustration of the weapons bay. And so we have two weapons bays on the B-2, and we could carry either a rotary launcher or a bomb rack assembly in either weapons bay. So the rotary launcher can carry up to eight 2,000-pound weapons, whereas the bomb rack assembly could carry up to 40 500-pound weapons. Now, during EMD, as, as Don said, we, we introduced the GPS-aided munitions towards the end of EMD, and that was carried just on the rotary launcher, and that's what we tested uh, during the later stages of EMD. At post-EMD, that's when we uh, transitioned to the smart bomb rack assembly, also referred to sometimes as a smart bra. And so that allowed us to integrate the GPS-aided munitions, the 500-pound the JDAMs on the airplane. The, uh, the other thing post-EMD um, that was integrated on the airplane was the, uh, the mother of all bombs. You've probably heard about that, uh, sometimes referred to the father of all bombs. So initially during EMD, we, were, we, we could carry up to 40,000 pound payload. With the addition of the MOAB or the GBU-57, uh, each of those weapons are 30,000 pounds. So that allowed us to carry up to 60,000 pounds of payload. So tremendous capability for the B-2. So that's a little bit of background on the configuration of the airplane. It gives us, uh, gives the B-2 tremendous flexibility in the types and numbers of weapons that it can carry. And uh, as John said, it was the first aircraft to carry the GPS-aided munitions. So with that, I'll go to the next slide, which provides a little bit more detail as far as the types of uh, weapons that we could carry. So up on the top left-hand side, you'll see the, uh, in the smart bomb rack assembly, top two weapons are, are unaided or un GPS uh, aided weapons. The bottom one is the JDM 82 that you see there, the, uh, the 58 pounder. And then uh, you can again see a picture of the smart bra as well as the RLA. So the only difference between the, the original bomb rack assembly and the smart bomb rack assembly is that we integrated the hardware on that bomb rack assembly necessary to connect to these smart weapons. So that allowed us to add those, those uh, additional JDAMs uh, onto the aircraft. The, uh, and then on the far right side of the slide, you see some of the weapons that we could carry on the rotary launcher. So the rotary launcher carry, allows us to carry the heavier weapons, uh, initially the 2,000 pound weapons, and then, and then later on in the program, the 5,000 pound uh, GBU, which again gave the B2 tremendous capability. 
And then the, more recently, as I said, the GBU, which would fill up an entire weapons bay. You wouldn't have a, an ROA or a bomb rack assembly because that weapon is so huge. Okay. And then, of course, the, the nuclear weapons also that we carry. So this next slide, we're going to walk you through the progression of, of weapon delivery, bombing platforms, if you will, starting from World War II all the way to present day, just to give you an appreciation for the increase in capability. So first off, we'll start with World War II with the B-17. So to take out a single target, it took 1,500 sorties uh, to take out a single target. Well, why was that? Well, because the CEP, the circular error probable, or the accuracy of the weapons that the, B uh, the B-17s were carrying were 3,300 feet, you know, over a half mile uh, you know, accuracy, if you will. And so that's why it took so many weapons. And of course, the weapons were a little bit smaller back then, 250 pounds, to, in order to take out a single target. So next, we progress to Vietnam. Of course, our weapon delivery systems have become, uh, were upgraded over time, uh, more accurate. And so in this example, we have the F-4, and uh, the, the CEP was 400 feet. So an order of magnitude improvement in the circular error probable. And in that particular example, it would take 30 F-4s to take out a single target, dropping 176 500-pound weapons. So next, we move to Desert Storm. And in this example, we use the F-117. So with, the, uh, with Desert Storm, uh, laser-guided munitions were available, and those had CEPs on the order of uh, 10 feet. And so this, in this example, the 117 could carry two of those weapons. So the F-117 could take out two targets during Desert Storm. Then lastly, we progress to, B, to the B-2. So in this particular instance, one sortie carrying 16 2,000-pound weapons could take out all the targets on a, this particular airfield. So you can see the tremendous change and in increase in capabilities. And so we went from the paradigm of starting off in World War II as how many de determining how many airplanes would take to take out a single target to today where we have to figure out how many targets can a single airplane take out? So just a, a tremendous increase in capabilities over a, a short period of time. We had a, a very successful flight test program with no major incidents or mishaps. But we did learn a number of lessons along the way. There are a number of interesting things that are worth talking about, well exceed what we have the time for, but I'll touch on a few of them here. This slide illustrates a typical envelope for an airplane, max altitude, airspeed, minimum airspeed, and as well, text inside speaks to the various areas of interest in flight test as you proceed in those areas. Of particular interest to this, as we briefed it before, was the comment in the upper left. We were a high visibility program, and we were subjected early on, despite our cutting edge nature of activity, to a grading system that placed inappropriate pressure for inappropriate expectations in performance early on. But we were fortunate in having mature and strong top level leadership that protected us at the working level. So we were able to proceed in a calm, measured, and safe way in doing the work we needed to do. I like these two discoveries because they're visible. If you can get close enough to the airplane, you can physically see the manifestation of these things. B-2 is controlled in pitch and roll by elevons on the trailing edge. She uses split elevons at the wing tips for directional stability and control as well as speed brakes, opening them simultaneously. We found early on that our elevons were not as effective as expected. And so on a design condition at altitude, they were not in the appropriate position. The fix to that was to reflex the trailing edge, as you see on the slide. You could see that today if you look at an airplane. And that placed the elevons back in their desired position. The other one had to do with the split elevons. As we got faster early on, we found that those split elevons were being sucked apart by aerodynamic forces. Uh, we can't afford to have that. That would constitute a corner reflector for radar. So the initial fix to that for us was to tailor hydraulic pressure to the rudders to hold them closed more effectively. The ultimate fix was, again, aerodynamic at a bump at the trailing edge of the rudders called rudder bumps, and that worked to hold them closed. This next fix is not so visible, but much more intrusive and significant. The airplane was initially designed in pitch to use a, a 
speed stability system, much like a, a typical airplane that's pulleys and cables, giving the pilot a speed stable feel for how the airplane is flying. But that system became too complicated to deal with in adapting to our wide speed range and more especially various configuration changes, in particular opening and closing weapon bay doors. The result of trying to adapt that and doing it unsuccessfully would have been a significant overgee to the airplane. So what we ultimately did was change the pitch control law to a pitch rate system, much like modern day fighters. We retained the, uh, what you call an alpha Q, or uh, stick speed stability feel system for power approach. This slide speaks to and illustrates some characteristics of the airplane that contributed to an, uh, an event we had in flight test that created some considerable excitement for the control room. We have a Mach limit that has one contribution that is that is deals with pitch stability. As the airplane gets faster, then her stability in, the, in pitch is reduced. As well, we have an angle of attack limiter for the same reason. We don't ever really want to stall the airplane. If we did, then the airplane would pitch up uncontrollably. As well, that stability reduces as Mach increases. So the angle of attack limiter becomes more and more narrow as the airplane speeds up. Finally, the airplane is really clean, as you might imagine, and so if she gets very much nose down, she accelerates very easily. These three things can combine to create what we came to call a coffin corner. The nose gets a little down, the airplane begins to accelerate, the pilot begins to run out of sufficient angle of attack to pull the airplane out effectively, and then unavoidably overspeeds or flies too fast. And this actually happened to one of our air crew well after envelope expansion in a pretty plain vanilla wind-up turn test maneuver, part of a spec compliance event, where they got into that condition and got significantly past our maximum mock. They recovered safely, but not without considerable excitement on the part of the control room as the airplane was beginning to go unstable. So there is another characteristic we discovered that involved a sustained oscillation in certain configurations at high speed. We came to call it residual pitch oscillation. We are pretty sure but it involved the, the uh, short period mode of the airplane, the first wing bending mode of the airplane, and certain configurations. And I'll let this video run here so that you can see it. Seven, seven. Golly! That's a flat. Oh. Alpha point. Copy, stand by. So there will be a slow motion replay of this. But while there was great reluctance to call this flutter, I think that was a programmatic kind of feeling, it seemed fair to call it a servo aero elastic phenomenon. <laughs> To air crew, it was a distraction, and more importantly, it was the potential source of an inadvertent overgee. We addressed it with indications to air crew that the condition was impending, and we addressed it as well with configuration guidelines to avoid the condition altogether. This is an old saw, expect the unexpected in life, but in flight test especially it applies. We have had a number of things that are interesting, and there are a few listed here. I'll speak to just a couple of them. The area that we, in which we work is a multi-use uh, airspace. It's not restricted and, and limited to only yourself and nobody else. Early on during envelope expansion, we had an airplane out. The air crew is performing some flight control envelope expansion. When Chase piped up, that there was an airdrop operation going on in front. Parachutists were coming out of an airplane. The B-2 crew pitched over to avoid those parachutists and inadvertently ended in, uh, entered into a speed area to which the flight controls had not been cleared yet. While again, like their previous example, they did recover safely, the flight controls were beginning to demonstrate instability. The other one I'll speak to is, has to do with computers. We all know computers only do what you tell them to. So 
Our flight control computers had been programmed for less than seven knots in ground taxi and more than seven knots in ground taxi. But one day, uh, one of our B2s managed to sit at seven knots, and we got a four-channel flight control restart as a result. Okay, so I'm going to uh, show you a couple of uh, videos here of some uh, weapons uh, releases, some demonstrations we did during uh, flight test. The first one is during flight test during the EMD phase, and it was towards the, the end of the EMD phase where we demonstrated the capabilities of the uh, GPS-aided munitions. Uh, and then the next clip is going to show you later, back in two, uh, 2003, um, the integration of the smart bomb rack assembly that I talked about earlier and dropping the, uh, the JDAMs, uh, up to 80 JDAMs. So this first release was in the Nevada range back in 1996. And these were 2,000-pound uh, uh, weapons. They were live weapons. And a single B-2 dropped eight of them just to demonstrate the capability of this new GPS-aided uh, uh, munition capability. So one of the limitations with the early on with the rotary launcher, you can, you, when you release a weapon, you have to rotate down to the next weapon. So you're limited as far as how many weapons you can drop in a short period of time. Now with the JDM 82s uh, you can drop lots of weapons in a very short period of time. So you'll see in this video all 80 weapons come out. And they're dropping on a simulated airfield, which you'll see uh, here in a second. So they just keep on coming and coming. And so uh, they use some C-Vans to simulate uh, aircraft hangars or uh, ground shelters. This is a before picture of the C-Vans. And these were inert weapons. And the reason they wanted to use inert weapons is to show the accuracy of the weapons of taking out these uh, aircraft shelters as well as the taxiways and the runway. So you can see a weapon in each, each C-Van as well as in the center of that simulated shelter as well as in the center of the taxiway right in front. And so they, they took out you know, the entire simulated airfield in that particular uh, weapons drop. Now, you know, we were talking about earlier that you know, we went from how many airplanes to take out, um, you know, one target to one airplane taken out, you know, how many targets can you take out? Well, we actually didn't have enough targets for 80 weapons on this airfield. And so we had eight weapons left over. And so we said, well, we're not gonna bring them back home. We need to figure out what we're gonna do with them. So one of our ingenious mission planners came up with a way to really show the tremendous capabilities of, of, these, of this new weapon system integrated with the B-2 something that would really send a message to our potential adversaries in the future. So this is what he came up with. <laughs> so th I think that sent a good message to our potential adversaries. So it showed our, our kinder side as well as... Uh, <laughs> okay, so again, that was one of our, our mission planners during there and yeah. Uh, during that time phase. So the next few slides, I'm going to talk about some of the conflicts that the B-2 was involved in, just to give you an appreciation again for its capabilities and, and how well this new stealth technology and, and some of the other features of the, of the B-2 worked out. So first of all, uh, we started off with uh, Operation Allied Force. That was a Kosovo-Serbia conflict, and that was back in 1999. So that was the first employment of the B-2 in conflict. Now, leading up to this, uh, this conflict, there was a little, some apprehension on a few folks on whether this new stealth technology was actually going to work. And uh, the first night, you know, the B-2 was there to open up the war along with uh, some, stealth, some uh, cruise missiles along the way. So the B-2s came in, they finished the night, and it removed all doubt as far as the capability of stealth as well as the B-2s, uh, other technologies. And, uh, and that opened up essentially uh, a new, new period in, in, in warfare, if you will, with the integration and the implementation of, of uh, B-2 in combat. So during that conflict, the B-2s flew uh, 51 sorties, which was just a small percentage of the overall sorties during that conflict, and they took out a third of the targets uh, during that, uh, that particular conflict uh, within the first eight weeks. So again, a very good showing, very good f first showing of the B-2. Um, they got a lot of attention from all the, the generals across all the services about the capability of the, of the B-2. And, and it became very popular you know, amongst uh, the services as far as uh, the capability that it could provide. Then the next conflict uh, that the B-2 participated in was in the uh, 2001 Operation Enduring Freedom. And again, the B-2 was used to kick down the door uh, during that uh, initial conflict in Afghanistan in 2001. After that, 2003 Operation Iraqi Freedom, 
flew 22 sorties from a Ford operating location as well as 27 sorties from, from Whiteman Air Force Base. Now, those first three conflicts, that was all before the, the uh, Whiteman Air Force Base had declared full operational capability. So at, later that year in 2003, they did. So uh, the, the, the wing and the, was still building up as far as their full capability during those three conflicts. Then uh, after that, 2011, the B-2 participated in another conflict uh, in Libya this time, Operation Od Odyssey Dawn, and they delivered uh, 16 uh, 45 guided 2,000 pound JDMs during that conflict. And then more recently, this last January, the B-2s again uh, went back to Libya to take out some ISIS targets. And this time, uh, they used the, uh, the JDM-82s, the, uh, the 500-pound GPS-aided weapons. And two airplanes delivered 100 weapons uh, in that particular uh, uh, um, operation. So this is a, a picture that was very popular uh, during uh, Operation Allied Force uh, that was shown around after the B-2s uh, entered the conflict there. So this is a picture of the Navasad Railway and Highway Bridge in Serbia. Previous attempts to try and take this bridge out by other platforms, including the F-117. So one of the issues, you know, over in uh, Eastern Europe is the weather. You know, if you, uh, with the laser-guided munitions, they're very accurate, but if you have a cloud between you and the target, they don't work very well. So they, they brought in a, they decided to bring in the B-2s to, to see if they could take out this particular bridge. So they, they brought in one B-2 with eight JDAMs to take out this bridge. And they were just hoping to take at least one span of the bridge. Well, this is what happened. <laughs> they took out the entire bridge. And so they not only you know, prevented traffic going across the bridge, they prevented traffic going up and down the river because the debris from the destruction of that bridge blocked the river, essentially. So very impressive showing of the capability of, of just a single B-2. It always amazed me in this program that competent and educated scientists and engineers could have thought that this airplane would crash, especially given the history of Northrop and flying wings. Yet, that was true. One of our engineers encountered a television crew shortly before first flight on an elevator commenting that they fully expected the airplane to crash and that crashes make great TV. So a question for the audience here. Uh, how do you know if a B-2 pilot is going into combat? Anybody know? Yeah, so if he's carrying a, a lawn chair, then that's a hint that he may be going to war. So why is that? So uh, typically when you go on a, on a training mission, you're just carrying your helmet bag and some, some uh, gear. But for these, these combat missions, they were on the order of 30 plus hours. You know, going back to Kosovo, they were 30 hours plus, and then the, later on Afghanistan and, and the other conflicts go all the way over to the Middle East and come back to Whiteman. Those were 40 plus hour missions. And so in the B-2, there was no bunk built into the, the airplane, but there's enough space uh, on the back side of the, the ejection seats and the back uh, bulkhead in order to, for, to put one of these chase lounges back there so the pilots could take a break, they'd rotate out periodically to get the uh, power naps. And so the, the folks from uh, Whiteman Air Force Base, they went down to the local Walmart, picked up a few of these chairs, and the rest is history. <laughs> um, so very affordable solution to uh, integrating a bunk into the airplane. So the, um, but one of the interesting things about preparing for you know, these conflicts where you go all the way you know, to the, uh, the theater and then come back was that, um, you know, talking 30, 40 hour missions, was how do, you, how do you manage your sleep cycles, you know, your, essentially your meals, so that you're at you know, peak alertness when you're over the, the combat area. So, the, so Whiteman, they brought in experts uh, that are experts in the circadian rhythm, rhythm, sleeping cycles, nutritionists and such, and so they gave a, a, some training to the pilots to say, here's when you need to take your naps, uh, well, here's how you need to space them out, how long you need to take the nap for, so it's just your peak alertness when you get over the, cop, the combat area. So they did that, and of course you have the adrenaline rush when you're over the combat area as well to, to help you get through that phase of the mission. But getting back home was one of the harder parts because uh, flying these long missions, you have to refuel the airplane four or five times. So that fifth refueling, particularly if it's a nighttime, you know, coming in, it's a home stretch, you know, it's the, the final inning, it's you're in overtime, it's the last mile of the marathon. You know, doing that last refueling was very challenging for the pilots, but they all did it. You know, they all did it and got back home safety, safely, and that's a testament to the training, as well as the B-2. The, the B-2 is a very nice flying airplane compared to some of the air, other aircraft. I flew the B-52, and that was a very challenging airplane to, to, to air refuel. So, a very, another, again, another testament to the flying qualities of the B-2. Early in the program, well before we flew, I, I encountered, wished I had kept a copy of an article by a Dr. Weiss. No relation who uh, claimed that 
aliens helped us design and build and taught us how to fly the B-2, or we're going to. And you can still find this sort of thing on the internet. Google it, and you'll find all kinds of folks who honestly at least express that they believe this. But I can tell you that we are not an anti-gravity craft. We don't have electrogravitic systems in the airplane. We don't use artificial intelligence. And we don't have extraterrestrial brain cells, and we don't have neurochips. I have one of those patches. I've always wondered where that came from. I guess maybe that gustatus uh, similis polis, they, maybe they really do taste like chicken. <laughs> Over the years, the, the B-2 has, has appeared in several films. You may have seen some of them. Uh, Transformers, Independence Day, Broken Arrow, where uh, John Travolta uh, appeared as a rogue test pilot in the B-2, and a few other films along the way. Now, when we were building this, this briefing back in 2014, the, uh, the B-2 also had appeared alongside another uh, famous aircraft, uh, the Lockheed Martin F-22 Advanced Tactical Fighter. And so during, during, those, uh, uh, during those movies, the, you know, the B-2 was, we always said, was the leading role uh, in those particular films. <laughs> and, and, and the B-2 had not only seen combat in these movies, it had also seen combat in real life, whereas the F-22 hadn't. Uh, up until just uh, uh, when we gave the briefing, at the, uh, the week prior to when we first gave this briefing back in 2014. And so we had the saying, well, you know, the F-22, always the bridesmaid, but never the bride. So any Lockheed Martin folks here? Uh, <laughs> this? <laughs> okay. So, but uh, again, that, during that week, uh, the, the F-22 went into combat, and what did it do? It delivered a bomb. So, uh, so the, uh, the, the F-22 went down in history, you know, being a, a B-2 wannabe, I think. So, but, but we all know the B-2 is going to continue to be the, play the leading role in any, in any movie or, or, or combat uh, uh, conflict in the future. And, and the F-22 will play a you know, supporting role, but a very important supporting role to the B-2. During uh, terrain following testing and the development of low observable surface treatments, we did encounter uh, issues with regard to rain, no pun intended. Those are expected kinds of things. They happen when you do when you expose things to new environments, <clears throat> or you work with a radar and try to distinguish between the ground and rain. But we had significant detractors and the media who seized upon these things to, to attempt to place our program in a bad light. So I guess you could say we could credit ourselves with another first, the advent of fake news. <laughs> There is a sometime misconception running around that stealth equals invisibility. Actually, the function of stealth or low observables is to reduce the detection capability of the enemy so that there are holes created inside their defensive network. Then one uses tactics to find your way through those holes. So stealth does not equal invisibility. It actually is the combination of low observability and tactics. And Don, uh, this, is, uh, this slide is a, a late intro to the presentation. Um, it was a, uh, just the first time we're going to publicly release this. But you know, what Don told you was the, offic the official message about stealth does not equal uh, invisibility. Uh, but well, let's just roll this film and see, and see what, what the B-2 is really capable of. Gauging stealth mode now. Disengaging stealth mode, my count. Three, two, one, now. What do you think, Don? Uh, you know, Troy, I, I think maybe uh, you should stay here. We should get out those non-disclosure statements, or better yet, uh, let's put them on. <laughs> All right, folks, any of you have any questions, the answers are right here, right here. So as you were saying, Troy, I think, uh, yeah. Now, as we were saying, stealth does not equal invisibility. I say again, I repeat, stealth does not equal invisibility. Everybody got that straight? Okay. So beyond the first 25 years. So the, uh, we've seen that the B-2 has had a very impressive history. We, we made it safely through EMD testing, one of the largest you know, flight test programs in, uh, to date uh, with the B-2. Made it through that, that period safely, demonstrated how well the B-2 performed in conflict. And uh, there's certainly some things in, in store for us. So we've been, you know, constantly working on the B-2 since 
the early manufacturing design phase over the last 25 years, and there's still a bright future ahead of the, the B2. Some of the things that we're looking forward to is upgrading the defensive management system in the airplane, so that's going to be a huge undertaking to give us, uh, again, increased capability going forward. We're replacing some of the old uh, CRT technology, that's the cathode raid tubes for any of the youngsters in the audience there. So. Um, yep, those are 1980s technology, to, uh, but we're replacing those with LCDs, which will give us a high-resolution TV cap type of capability in the cockpit. We're also improving the communication systems on the airplane, essentially you know, providing internet in the sky um, where we can communicate um, with the other platforms that may be in theater and also provide information back and forth to folks uh, back at the, uh, the various KOX. And then uh, also uh, we continue to add uh, additional weapons capabilities uh, to the B-2 as well. As new weapons come available, um, um, we in integrate them on the weapons if it's appropriate to do so. So a bright future ahead for the, for the B-2, and I expect it'll be around for many years to come. So yes, in closing, our plane broke new ground and added many things to aerospace and combat aviation. We encountered many unexpected and learned uh, items and learned a number of lessons, and yet we successfully completed a test program with no major incidents or mishaps. We operated under tremendous pressure, but safely and in a measured and successful way. And we've kept our airplane uh, consistent with the times. She continues to develop and keep up with the needs of the military. So, uh, Troy, I think you've got a little video to speak to, and then we'll have time for Q&A. Okay, so this video captures some of the highlights uh, from the, the B-2 test program. Uh, again, we had six airplanes, from, we went from 89 to 96, and then we transitioned into, into post-EMD flight test. But it really captures some of the, uh, the, the significant uh, accomplishments of the B-2 test team. Not only the, the test team, but the, the people that built as well as tested the airplane. So historical effort uh, on their part on getting through this safely and delivering this tremendous uh, capability to the warfighter. up to questions. So the question was the Guam takeoff issue and rebuilding. So that, that was a, an unfortunate you know, uh, accident that we're referring to here at, uh, at Guam. Um, the, uh, well, you talk about, yeah, you know, you, which uh, there's the accident and there was, uh, and there was uh, the fire. So the, um, and so what we did, Northrop Grumman along with the, uh, you know, our counterparts and the government went back and fixed uh, an airplane. So it was a tremendous undertaking uh, both on uh, our side and you know, the contractor side, or, or suppliers as well as you know the government, and making that happen. Um, so it was uh, a you know year plus long effort, and uh, got the airplane back here in great condition. So. Speak to that a little bit, yeah. Troy. Um, so my uh, um, so the airplane had an engine fire on uh, on Guam, and 
the, there was considerable damage done to the right side of the airplane as a result. They were relatively expensive and limited assets. So, the, uh, so as a program, we decided <coughs> that recovering the airplane would be a good idea and possible. Obviously, considerable involvement on our part, uh, Northrop Grumman, in the engineering part of that. A team went out, put the airplane into sufficient shape that she could be flown back to the continental United States. The, uh, a shipment of mine, Tom LeBeau, made that sortie with an Air Force pilot, brought her back to Palmdale, and then our guys went to work there. And so in uh, two years after, uh, four years after the, uh, the fire, then she went back to Whiteman. And uh, Spirit of Washington, she's flying again today. So the, the question is, um, the, the makeup of the crew and the duties of each crew member. And uh, going back in time, the, the original plan for the B-2 was actually to have three crew members. And then uh, uh, during the early stages of development, when they were still designing the airplane, they decided, no, they could get by with just two crew members. And so uh, and there was also some talk about what should the crew, of those two crew members, what should the makeup be? Should they be a pilot on one side and a navigator on the other side? Because going back in history, uh, I started off in B-52s, um, in the B-52, you had you know, six crew members, you had two pilots, uh, two navigators, you had a, a gunner, and you also had an electronic warfare officer. And then you transitioned to the B-1, you went from six crew members to four crew members, so two pilots, a, a, a radar navigator, and a WISO weapon system operator. And, uh, and, uh, and so in the B-2, because of the, uh, the, the new technologies that were available to us, we could uh, you know, reduce the crew size down to two. So the question was, who should, you know, should one be a pilot and one be a, wi a WISO weapon system officer, or, sh or should they both be pilots? And the Air Force decided to go with two pilots. And the reason behind that was because we talked about you know, the long duration missions, you know, 40 plus hours, and, and one of the more challenging things to do in the B-2 from a flying standpoint, hand flying the airplane, was a refueling. So they decided, you know, having a second pilot, you know, that you could share the duties there. Um, and it gives you a lot more flexibility as far as going from left to right seat and such. So, and, and, the, and the other uh, unique thing about the B-2 is the, uh, the pilot, the person that primarily flies the airplane is in, is in the left-hand side, where, and the mission commander is on the right-hand side. And the mission commander is responsible for essentially managing all the weapon systems on the airplane. He also gets to fly too, uh, but that's the more challenging part of the, uh, the mission, if you will, managing all the, the, the weapon systems, the weapons delivery system, the radar, uh, and so on. And so uh, the mission systems commander was typically the more senior person. They would start off in the, in the right seat as, as a or the left seat as a pilot and then transition to the right seat to become a mission commander. So the question is, stealth reduces the shape of the airplane, reduces the signature of the airplane, but how do you reduce the, the heat, the temperature that's coming from the, the engines and, and, and such? So, um, so um, there's a lot, again, part of the design was trying to figure out how to reduce that heat. You know, you have special, specially designed exhaust, uh, the tail especially designed has, you know, uh, certain materials that help us reduce uh, and eliminate the, uh, the, the exposure, if you will, the signal that uh, could be seen by, you know, potential bad guys. So that, that was designed in. I mean, they looked at all the things that could give you away uh, from a, a visit, you know, LO is just more than, than radar signature. Of course, it's IR and, and other aspects um, as well. So. so the question is, how many folks in the audience today worked on some part of the B-2? Yeah. Okay. So, so again, a, a, a testament, you know, to all the hard work. I mean, certainly you know, hours and hours, you know, long weeks, days, you know, building the B2 and then, and then transitioning the test. And Don and, and I got to do the fun part, flight tested. So, so we appreciate, really appreciate all the hard work that everybody in the audience did. I, I think what I hear you saying, sir, is, um, and I can relate to this, my wife especially can relate to this. The, uh, uh, at the early, especially at the early point in time for uh, many programs of this nature, they are black. They are invisible to the world except for those who are working on the program. And uh, what you propose is that, or the, the question you propose is, shouldn't some of these things stay that way? And uh, so first I'll say that we were black when I joined and my wife uh, had no idea 
<laughs> until we, until we, she read about it in the paper, and then it was, oh, oh. <laughs> it's uh, that's an interesting life to lead, being that way. Uh, but there comes a point where um, uh, an airplane like a B-2 rolls out and the world sees it. It cannot be kept under wraps anymore. And uh, our program was destined to see the light of day in some respect. There are still parts of the program that are highly protected, as you can imagine. Signature is one of those. Low observability is another. If I might tout, uh, uh, blow our Northrop Grumman horn a little bit, if there's something we're really good at, that's one. And those things are highly protected and, uh, and will be, will continue to be. But other parts of the airplane uh, are out there and you folks as well as the rest of the country spent a lot of money on these. Each of these was 21, now 20 airplanes are uh, nearly $2 billion airplanes if you add it up. Uh, you deserve to know a little bit about it and it doesn't hurt for you to. And frankly, from my perspective, it doesn't hurt for an enemy to see videos like those 80 bombs running down an airfield, touching every piece of that airfield that we want to with a bomb. I think that's pretty, uh, pretty effective and a pretty effective demonstration of what we can do if we need to. Sir, thank you, sir. Uh, Troy, um, you flew the B-52, and so uh, I'll let you speak to this. It's an interesting question. Um, we're not any better qualified to speak to that than any of you folks, to be quite honest. But Troy has time in the airplane, and so he has an emotional attachment. He might, uh, he might speak differently than me. I don't know. Yeah, so uh, the question was uh, whether or not um, the B-52, since they've been around so long, and, uh, whether or not um, some of that capability from the B-52s is, is going to be transitioned to B-2 or B-21, essentially. Um, and so, so as I was saying, the, the, the B-52, I know the Air Force you know, is looking at plan, uh, keeping those airplanes for around for a while longer. There have been some talk about re-engineering those airplanes. And I don't know the details. I'm, I'm not involved in, in, in any of those uh, type of... Uh, activities at this point, but for my B-52 experience, the, uh, the B-52 still provides capability from a standpoint, you can launch, you know, cruise missiles from the B-2 longer range, you know, uh, weapons, if you will. Uh, so, so the B-52 can stay outside harm's way and still deliver weapons, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future. And then the, the other consideration is, you know, once you've gone into an area and taken out all the air defenses, uh, the ground as well as air-based air defenses, B-52 can still deliver weapons, and it can do it, you know, still re reasonably uh, affordably, you know, compared to some of the, uh, the more advanced aircraft out there. And so the, the B-52 still has some life left in it. You know, they've gone back over the years. It goes back to the depot. They straighten out the wings. You know, they smooth out the, the wrinkled skin on the B-52, and they put it back into, into commission. So, so I, I just have to add, you know, uh, your first airplane is always your greatest love. <laughs> so, yeah, so the, uh, but a uh, little side story here. So B-52, again, older than I was in some cases, and, and the B-2 was the first new airplane I got to go fly, so it still had the new car smell on it, so that was pretty awesome to be able to do that. So, What, how fast does it fly? How high does it go? <laughs> oh, Jiminy. Well, 0.8 Mach. So the question was, how fast have we each individually flown the airplane? Um, I was participating in envelope expansion, and, uh, but I honestly don't recall whether I was ever on a, an expansion test point exceeding 0.8. We did exceed 0.8. We flew the airplane to 0.82 as part of our, at least part of flutter in envelope expansion, and then we limit the operational world back to 0.8 Mach. Um, the, uh, just as an extension of that, and I'll give Troy a chance to to uh, spin some tail. Um, the, uh, the airplane flies really, really well. And uh, that, so that event about which we spoke where uh, an air crew performing a wind-up turn ended up flying too fast, uh, that test maneuver takes the airplane into a regime where attention is required in order, to, in order to not let those kinds of things happen. But it's not, and this is no, no uh, inference on their capabilities, 
it's not a difficult thing to avoid, uh, but if you are distracted, it can happen, and sometimes distractions can come along, like those parachutists that I spoke about earlier. So sometimes things happen, but it's not too hard to, to uh, handle the airplane there. She, she flies very, very nicely. She has a few interesting characteristics, but none that I would say are bad in any way. Um, Troy, anything to add? So yeah, what's your, what's your max mock? So yes, yeah, test pilots, we have to be very disciplined. We're given test cards to tell us you know, the conditions. So we always go to what the test cards say, right? <laughs> That's my story. Sticking. So the, the question is, what's the workload on the mission commander when he has to retarget 80 weapons? So I don't have as much recent experience, because uh, I don't fly the B-2 any longer, but, but Don can probably talk to that since he's been involved with some of that. OK. Um, so you know, the, um, uh, firstly, the, the airplane missions don't typically include retargeting 80 weapons at a time. The, uh, I'm trying to think how best to answer that. Um, I suppose first to explain the manner in which those weapons are employed. The, the weapons are employed uh, in a targeting structure that links several targets together. Uh, we call it a linked target complex. It's on each target lat long, each target coordinate uh, could be the center of a radar map in which that one might take. And then we can have 16, we call them DIMPIs, desired mean points of impact. That's sort of engineering speak for the thing you want to blow up because weapons don't have uh, 100% accuracy. They they are an air. They they'll hit within an area that you, that is small for a guided weapon. So you call it a mean point of impact. It's a anyway. It's not an interesting side to you. But so each target can have 16 dimpies associated with it, and you typically then have a number of targets and a number of dimpies associated with each of those, and the crew would manage this target complex in conducting an attack. If they were being asked to change some of those, it probably wouldn't be very many. Um, the, uh, it would be a few, perhaps, or one or two. Or, more than likely, it would be some small number, perhaps a single target, and, uh, and just a couple of dimpies. The employment of all 80 weapons at one time, despite the demonstration, would be an unusual mission to undertake. Um, so that uh, if the crew wanted to do that, there are a couple of different ways, more or less workload intensive. The greatest workload intensive one would be, we have a data entry panel through which one can access the targets and edit lat longs for those, for those individual dimpies. And one would go in there and then we call it hand jamming in the coordinates to alter where that should be. The, the other way that one could do it would be across the Link 16 system, the, one, the air crew could be sent a target update, which they would then accept into the airplane, and then it would be right there, and that's pretty non-intrusive. Sort of an in-between way is there's a, there is a strap-on communication system called the PRC-117 that can receive mission files across satellite links and then be written to a piece of media that could be introduced into the airplane and a new mission dumped into the airplane in that way. That one is a little more work intensive because it requires crew involvement in creating the media and then putting it in the airplane. So there are several ways, but um, I think the most uh, relevant part is any of that sort of editing would be typically small in nature as I understand it, perhaps for a time critical target that uh, was a fleeting opportunity and those would not be an extensive number of, of targets. So the question was have we ever uh, operated the airplane beyond 1.0 and in a combat session, uh, situation would she be able to? The uh, First I'll tell you our airplane, like all airplanes, have an envelope within which they fly. 
and the outer edges of that envelope are real boundaries. They are not available for penetration uh, in some pilot perceived need to go outside there. They are there because something bad will happen if you do that. Like you'll come apart or your engines will overheat. In the case of the F-104, for instance, she had a max mock because the uh, engines would over engine engine would overheat if you went too too fast. That was kind of an interesting and unusual one. Uh, they might be something like they'll start to flutter or their structure will fail. Anyway, uh, so it's not available. Um, as an aside, just look at her. I think she's a beautiful airplane, but Mach one really. <laughs> uh, it's uh, however comma. Um, you recall the video, the last one, the stealth video. The, that was a real cloud forming around the airplane. And inside that cloud, you saw smaller clouds forming on parts of the airplane. Uh, those were a result of what are called uh, expansion waves. As air is coming across the airplane, she was probably in the vicinity of 0.8 Mach and at a relatively low altitude. And as air, air is coming across the airplane, it's speeding up, and in those localized areas, it is supersonic. There is some supersonic airflow across the airplane, but just in localized areas as a result of airflow. Oh, so the question was that uh, when the B-2s fly over the Pasadena on New Year's Day as part of the Rose Bowl parade, uh, have, have I flown or have Don? I, I haven't participated in, in, in those particular events. It's usually the Whiteman Air Force Base that sends the airplanes from Whiteman Air Force Base to, uh, to do the flyover for the Rose Bowl. So the question is, what, what is the binder that's used in the, in the composite materials of the airplane? And I'm a pilot, and, uh, so I couldn't answer that question. <laughs> and I don't know if Don, if you... <laughs> and, we, and if we knew, we probably couldn't tell you anyway, so. <laughs> I, I think it's pretty much like that. I, it's sticky, I'm sure. <laughs> But if I knew, I'm sure, I'm sure I couldn't tell you or wouldn't be allowed to tell you anyway. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.